Hello everyone, this is Showtime 112. In this video we will focus on so-called Package Q Strike. This was the largest airstrike of Desert Storm and remains the largest F-16 strike to this day. It was launched on 19 January 1991, the third day of the conflict. Until then, the city of Baghdad was only attacked by stealth aircraft and cruise missiles. Conventional aircraft avoided the so-called Supermez an extremely well defended area with overlapping SAM engagement zones and a huge number of anti-aircraft guns. But then, the coalition leadership decided to try a massive airstrike similar to Vietnam era Alpha strikes. All the strikers in the package were F-16s. Their support consisted of F-15Cs flying combat air patrol, 8 F-4G Phantoms as SEAT support and 2 EF-111 Ravens for electronic combat. The exact number of F-16s that participated in the strike varies from source to source, and it was between 56 and 72. Majority of them came from Emirates-based 388th Tactical Fighter Wing, while 401st Tactical Fighter Wing, based in Qatar, would provide 16 aircraft. This airstrike is best known for the hot tape from the aircraft of Major Emmet Tulia, who was attacked by no less than six Iraqi SAMs and he managed to avoid them all by nothing but maneuvering. We will cover his part in the airstrike, as well as that of Captain Keith Rosencrantz from 388 Tactical Fighter Wing. The main target of the airstrike was Tuwaita Nuclear Research Facility on the outskirts of Baghdad. Iraqi nuclear development capabilities had previously been attacked, first by Iran, and then in 1981 more successfully, and more famously by Israel. Iraqis once again tried to rebuild nuclear capability, and this time it was the US-led coalition that would attack the site. Secondary targets were headquarter buildings and an oil refinery in downtown Baghdad, and this would be responsibility of the 401st Tactical Fighter Wing under call sign Stroke. This was apparently changed late in the planning, and the problem was that the F-16s would first attack targets on the outskirts of the city, and then work their way towards the center, with the defenses having time to get ready. Airstrikes of such size are usually complex, and the first problem started to appear during the air refueling phase. Stroke flight from the 401st Tactical Fighter Wing was eventually cut down to only 8 aircraft for refueling or other technical issues. Their fighter and SEAT cover would also abandon the strikers earlier than anticipated for fuel shortage or because they had launched all of their weapons. Information about this somehow wasn't communicated properly and the strikers were unaware that they went unprotected in the final phase of their flight. group of F-16s was approaching the Tawaita facility, there were no warnings on their ECM scopes. Captain Rosencrantz was due to attack the target after about one-third of the strikers had completed their attacks. And indeed, the first group dropped their Mark 84s without much problems. When Rosencrantz was about 20 miles from the IP, he was starting to get SA-2 warnings.
site locked on him and launched a missile, quickly followed by another one. Caller 16, launch right 2 o'clock. Suddenly, radar warning scopes started to display various threats by all the SAM systems operated by Iraqis. Caller 16, 2 launch on the nose. Rosencrantz managed to avoid two SAMs and continued towards the target. But then he saw that he was targeted by a Hawk SAM battery. The system was probably taken from Kuwait after the occupation. Eventually, he avoided that missile as well. In his first air strike of the war, he missed the target due to exceptionally strong winds, which caused him to miss the bomb release point. He wasn't the only one to make this mistake, but now he was even more determined not to miss this time. He soon saw the target area was obscured by smoke, either from the first strikes or from Iraqi smoke generators. His only choice was to drop on the steer point diamond, which he eventually did. As Rosencrantz was regaining altitude after the drop, he was attacked by another missile. Being low on energy, he jettisoned his fuel tanks and avoided this final missile. Like most wingmen, he lost his leader but eventually found him on the radar and rejoined the formation.
F-16s from the 401st Tactical Fighter Wing continue towards their assigned targets in downtown Baghdad. Oil refinery was the only target not obscured by clouds. Just like in the case of strikers from the 388th, Iraqi systems all turned on at the same time. Massive AAA fire was accompanied by multiple SAM launches. Major Tulia, call sign Stroke 3, started to get SA-2 launch warnings just before his roll-in. He avoided the missiles and continued his attack, eventually dropping his Mark 84s on the oil refinery. Tulia pulled off and headed south, he was getting more radar warning receiver warnings and saw two missile plumes heading towards him. He then performed more evasive maneuvers.
these two missiles missed as well, but Tulia wasn't in the clear yet. The most dangerous challenge was ahead of him. Two SA-6 missiles were launched as he continued his egress. This was a more modern and more capable system. Having dropped his fuel tanks, Tulia decided not to use afterburners for the fear of not having enough fuel to return home. Tulia evaded the last two missiles nevertheless and finally escaped the missile engagement zone. After successfully reaching Qatar, he was surprised to find out that his aircraft never dispensed any of chaff or flares. It seemed that the system was malfunctioning and he evaded at least six missile launches without any help from his countermeasures. Two other pilots from the stroke flight were not so lucky. Captain Harry Roberts and Major Jeffrey Tice were hit by missiles. They both ejected and were subsequently captured by the Iraqis who showed them in their propaganda videos. Both were released after the war. To sum up, Package Q strike wasn't a huge success. The Whiter facility was only moderately damaged, while the oil refinery received significant hits. Two F-16s were lost. Large conventional airstrikes against downtown Baghdad were not repeated again in Desert Storm. Most attacks in this area were performed by stealth aircraft. I hope you liked the video. Be sure to press the like button, that helps the channel enormously. If you're able to, support the channel on Patreon to ensure future content. Subscribe if you haven't done so already, and keep watching Showtime Moment 2.